Hello, everyone. Welcome to a special episode of Geek Warning. Why is it special, you're wondering? Well, uh, while the regular weekly Geek Warning episodes will continue on with our usual group news and discussion formats, these episodes will publish on top of those every other week, diving deeper into particular subjects like our handy Ask a Wrench episodes, interviews with various industry notables, in-depth conversations on single subjects. Want to know how we tackle a stuck bottom bracket, perhaps, or diagnose a mysterious creak? What about how custom builders maybe tune the ride quality of a bespoke frame? Let's say you're trying to build the ultimate bike for whatever. How would our panel of experts do that? If you're a paid member of the Escape Collective, you not only get full access to those special episodes and can listen to them on repeat to your heart's desire. Just use a special link sent directly to your inbox for your digital ticket. Uh, but you can also rest assured knowing that it is your financial backing directly that actually makes it possible for us to record these episodes in the first place. If you're not a member, well, you'll still hear the occasional special episode, or at least part of them. Uh, certainly not all of them. Hopefully that'll be enough to whet your appetite for more. And without further ado, here is a teaser of what you are missing. Kicking things off for our members only Geek Warning podcast episodes is one of our everyone's favorites, Ask a Wrench, where we take a bunch of members submitted questions on a wide range of tech and maintenance related topics and put them in front of our panel of expert mechanics. For today's Ask a Wrench episode, we've got myself, my fellow tech editor partner in crime, Dave Rome. Hi, Dave. Hello. And we've got the long awaited return of Zach Edwards of the Boulder Group Heddo here in Boulder, Colorado. Hi, Zach. Hello. I actually did the math just before the show and I figured out that between the three of us, we actually have over 50 years of shop mechanic experience, which is kind of terrifying. I would have thought it was more than that, to be honest. I did say more than 50 years. It, it's, mm. I mean, Zach, the, numbers, Zach, I think, the numbers definitely improving all the time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're definitely never going down. Let's put it that way. Uh, well, you can, and I'd say, you know, you can maybe either consider that amount of professional shop experience to be a good thing or a result of a lot of bad decisions. I'm not really mm. sure which one we're going to choose, but that's neither here nor there right now. Either way, <laughs> What that means is hopefully we'll be able to answer your questions accurately and intelligently so you can not only get your bike back up and running, but ideally make it better in the process. Uh, Zach, it's good to have you back on the show. Yeah. Are, are, you, are you still now officially elbows deep in tubular glue now that we're in the thick of cross season? I just glued three sets of wheels this morning. Oh, you did? So, yeah. I kind of feel like I actually still smell a whiff of solvent. Maybe a little bit. I had some trying to get the, the windows open and stuff, but it's a little what's, cold out. What's the current glue of choice? Uh, Victoria. And then with the like Belgian tape for cross tires. So basically the, the, the established method for several years now. Yes. Yep. Nothing's yep. changed. Like tubular turns out, yeah. turns out it yep. still works. Uh, Dave, I want to know how many times in the past you've seriously looked into buying a TIG welder? Cause I have no doubt that the, the <laughs> idea has crossed your mind uh, at some point. Not just buying a TIG welder. I almost assigned myself into a uh, college, welding college, <laughs> like oh, an evening course, <laughs> like maybe a month ago. Yeah. I, I priced it up, figured out the schedule, figured out where it was. It was going to be six weeks, uh, once a week. Very entry level TIG welding course, but uh, didn't do it, but uh, it's still top of mind. So yes, uh, high, high on the list. Wow. wow that, was kind of a, this. that was kind of a, a shot in the dark, but I kind of nailed that one. Yeah, yeah, you did. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the questions since that's what, that's what everyone wants to hear here anyway. I guess we're just going to go in order here on the list. First question comes from David in New York. Uh, David's looking for some advice and tips on flying with a bike. Uh, he's borrowing a friend's Shikan Aerotech Evolution case. Uh, that's one of those cases where the handlebars stay on, uh, made for drop bars. Uh, and he's wondering if we had any pro tips that he should know beforehand, anything to make it easier and less worrisome for me. He doesn't want us to say to rent a bike. We don't know whether it's disc brake or rim brake, do we? That's we not do not. Although yeah. I don't think our, I don't I'm think sure. our, I would assume it'd be using these, way. But this case is because it has an integrated cockpit. That's probably a fair it's assumption. probably disc brake. Probably safe. Mm -hmm. Zach, I kind of want to start with you since, uh, if only <laughs> just by virtue of being partners with Ruth, you've probably flown with those cases quite a lot. I have flown with those cases a lot. They're great cases because it's super easy. You just basically take the wheels off, bolt the frame, basically the dropouts to a, a integrated frame in the base of the case, like with the through axle. So that's super easy. Slide the wheels in the wheel bags and good to go pretty much. A couple of weak points with that are the hoods usually get smashed in. So like TSA or wherever, throw your bike around. 
and they just get rotated in, that's a pretty easy fix. If you can even like pre-loosen them a little bit so you don't, things don't get damaged. Um, and then just straighten it back out when you build your bike up. Other thing I would definitely say is a weak point is the seat stays. Because a lot of bikes nowadays have really thin diameter seat stays. And I would say that's the number one thing I've seen with these cases is bikes getting a little squished and then the seat stays get cracked. So what I like to do instead of just using just like foam tubing, if you just take a cardboard box or something and kind of then wrap that around the seat stays as well to kind of give it some more structure, that seems to help a lot. Like a cutout panel of a cardboard box? Yeah, kind of just and then kind of like wrap it around so it kind of creates a box shape around the seat stays. Just some structure to prevent a little bit more. Anytime you fly with a bike, whether it's a soft case or a hard case, you're always taking a risk that things could get damaged, but you just have to want to try and mitigate that as much as possible. I've seen some people who have specifically flown with those cases who have, uh, have advised putting something in between the hoods to kind of brace them from getting bent. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, you could definitely do that too. I mean, I think it's, in my opinion, it's pretty easy to move a hood. So creating some PVC something or another that goes in between that's also still going to get smashed and like... I've seen people do that and their hoods still get rotated in. One option yeah. around that is uh, I'm thinking of a design that Oro Case were trying to implement. I don't know if they've brought it to production yet, but basically they'd taken the, the design approach of the original uh, Apple iPad cover, that sort of accordion style cover that would fold on itself. as it rigid in its, in its length, but uh, in its width, it can kind of fold. And they were trying to create that as a handlebar wrap to sort of overcome this very issue. And I think you could probably do the same by just cutting, you know, back to Zach's cardboard idea is you just get a big enough piece of like cardboard from a bike box, cut out a panel, the width of your handlebars, and you could probably sort of wrap that around. So again, it's rigid in its length, but it's, it's kind of follows the contour of the handlebar. So that might be another option if, if you can get it to fit still into the, into the bag comfortably. Yeah, and I guess another option for something like that, if you do, if you wanted to use something a little bit sturdier than just corrugated cardboard, is to use some of that coroplast stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's basically like the corrugated plastic that you yep. see sometimes in shipping cases. What are our thoughts as far as dealing with brakes, whether they be hydraulic or mechanical rim? Anything that that David needs to do? I mean, I would put the little spacers in the in the brake calipers for disc, so that if the levers get squeezed, you don't have to deal with that when you get to your destination. I would say taking rotors on or off. That's hot topic. Yep. Some people are very much like, you have to take them off because it's going to get bent or whatever. If it were my bike, I wouldn't take them off, but straightening a rotor. Like, I, I guess I would, some data point on this. So I worked for like UCI across a couple seasons and we would fly with two bikes and usually like four to six sets of wheels. And that's way too many rotors to take off every time. So I didn't take rotors off the entire time. And out of two seasons, I think I only had one rotor that actually got damaged. So... If it were my bike, I wouldn't take it off. And if it's very minorly tweaked, then I would just have a rotor trimming tool and straighten it. If it's center lock, you can bring a tool, take it off. It's super easy. Six bolt, it's kind of a pain to take the rotors on and off all the time. Yeah. If you don't want to potentially deal with it, take the rotors off. Yeah. For but, me, like when I travel with the bike, I'm not, I don't have spare sets of wheels or anything. So it's just the rotors on the bike are the rotors I'll have to run. And uh, for me, I don't take that risk because I have seen them get damaged more readily than i guess a lot of other components on the bike so for me i do take them off but i i understand that that's it's quite a barrier for a lot of people who have never removed yeah and i think too it's like it's on which end of travel do you want to deal with it right are you wanting to deal with potentially a bent rotor or are you wanting to deal with taking the rotor on and off like yeah you're doing some sort of work on either end of the trip uh do we have any thoughts on uh i've seen people suggest this before particularly if they're flying with hydraulic brakes do we have any thoughts on flying with a bleed kit I would say the average person probably doesn't know how to use said bleed kit. So well, yeah, so assuming you do know how to use it. I mean, I'm flying with my bike tomorrow and not bringing a bleed kit, but I also know that my bikes are bled well and there's not air that's just going to magically appear itself. Yeah, James, I feel like that was a, a very leading question. So like, what's what's the story there? You, I'll let you explain it. Nope, there is nothing wrong with your downloads. You can quit messing around with your phone or your computer right now. So remember how we told you at the beginning of the episode that this was just a teaser for the full members only special episode of Geek Warning? Well, we had to cut you off somewhere and that place was here. If you want to listen to the rest of the show and every special episode of the Geek Warning podcast, make sure you head over to escapecollective.com slash join to not only get full access to every one of our other members only podcasts, as well as all of our written content, but also to directly fund the work that we are doing here at Escape Collective. So head on over to the sign up page and we hope to see you there soon.